Tonight, I'm pleased to present a special edition of our program, a conversation with Francois Gillot, made possible by a grant from Payne Weber. Tonight's program is brought to you by the investment firm of Payne Weber. Mon histoire, c'est l'histoire d'un amour. Ma complainte, c'est la plainte de deux cœurs. Growing up in Paris, yeah. tell me about your father and your mother and what influence they may, as you look back, have had on you becoming the painter that you became. First of all, my mother was a good uh, watercolorist, yes. and she did ceramics also, but you know, at that time you didn't do it professionally, but she was extremely good and she had studied art history, etc. When I was five years old, I, I said, not knowing exactly what yeah. it entailed, I want to become a painter, like some other children say, I want to be a fireman, so <laughs> I wanted to be a painter. And my father was an, uh, an agronomist and a businessman, but he was mostly literary. He liked literature, philosophy, etc. My mother was really in the arts. In my family, everybody could draw fairly well. Yes. So it was something that everybody could do, but was not considered something that you will do for, as a profession. What did your father want you to do? Just to Well, I went to law school because my father wanted me to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I could paint all I wanted, yeah. but I had to, I had to uh, follow a normal course of study, which I don't regret. Like everybody else, I played the piano, but I, I, I knew I was not gifted. I, I love music, but I was not gifted. It, you know, it's either in art, it, you are born with it or you are not. You can learn if you are born with it. If you are not born with it, it's better to think about something if, else. If you're not born with it, you'll never be great. Yeah. yeah. But it took me exactly until I was about 21 to make sure in my, inside myself that uh, I would not regret having made that decision. You wanted to assure yourself that you had the right, the talent, or th that you were yeah, good? Yeah, because my, my father was a very intelligent man, so we had discussions together. So he said, you know, if you want to be uh, an attorney or medical doctor, yeah. a physician, something, if you are a good one, that's fine. If you want to be a painter, you have to be a great painter or nothing. So I thought he was quite right. So when I was 16, it was a bit difficult to... <laughs> As, as be certain and be able to tell my father was a bit, uh, uh, you know, awesome that, uh, yes, I know I can do that. No, I, I couldn't say that. At that time, I was working a lot, but I, I waited until I was 21. Then I left everything. And yeah. But to read about you for, in your own words is to find and discover this young woman who had her own head, who knew who she was, who was confident in herself who was smart and savvy beyond her years. Well, I think I owe that mostly also to my father, because my father was, in a sense, he was quite strict, but at the same time, uh, we could discuss things together and have some, like, contracts together, you know. If you, if you do this to please me, then you can do that which pleases you. So we would <laughs> trade. So I would do, as I said, I would study the law, but as he, as he <laughs> said jokingly, well, you know, you. If, uh, if you work eight hours in lo at law school, you can work eight hours with your paintings, and then you can go horseback riding <laughs> for an hour, and then you sleep four hours, and that, that's enough, you yes. know? And it was a little bit the way I lived. So my father, in a sense, uh, was, was not limiting me. He was just uh, helping me to, to, to be very aware or lucid about myself. Mm. Yeah, but was he a more profound influence than your mother, even though she was the artist in the family? Well, I think that, um, you see, my mother was the artist in the family. My father was my mentor intellectually, you might say. A broader sense of intellect. Well, it's not broader. Being artistic is more intuitive. and uh, my father Intuitive. Was, yes. Yeah. My father was more, much more rational. And which are you? Uh, <laughs> I am a bit crazy, <laughs> but I can be very logical. You see, yeah. logical delirium is what artists should have. Yeah. When did you finally say, I'm a painter, this is what I am? I said that uh, finally in uh, 1941, 
1941 was war years. Yes. 1941 was German occupation. Yes, of well, you see, that really had an effect on me because, uh, you know, I knew that in a way I could also not have been alive, you know. So after that, I thought, well, you know, I don't know how long we all remain alive, so I, I'm going to do what I want. I've interviewed so many people who've said, you know, it was only facing death that they began to realize the most important lesson in life, which is, A, you ought to be what you want to be, and secondly, you ought to live every moment of life yes. as if there's no tomorrow. Yes, that's, it, that's what happened to people of my generation, really. Uh, so people always ask, how come you were so mature? Well, we, we became, in my generation, we became mature from one day to the next because uh, that's what we thought, you know, our life was not yeah. worth a penny except that it was quite expensive to buy it back. But every day, you know, anything ca could happen. And we wanted, after that, that's why I really wanted to paint, to leave a kind of uh, témoignage, you know, something behind me, even if I didn't last myself. I wanted to say what I had, something that in I painting. had to say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The impact of the war on your work was what? Well, you see, uh, you know that I had my first exhibition in 43, right. in May of 43, and uh, when you had an exhibition in Paris at that time, there was always uh, the, you know, some German officers not in uniform would come to see if uh, there was no content in the show that would be against them. Uh, so most of what we did was to do it symbolically. Yeah. So for example, in 43, I had a painting called, it looked like a still life, but it was called the hawk, and there was a taxidermized hawk in the first plane, and knives and scissors, you know, things that mm. are hurting, and behind there was uh, a landscape of Paris. Was that the most exciting time of your life? Because no, it was well, war, because... Well, it was a tragic time in life. It was not a, such an exciting time. It was a very tragic time. You know, my, many of my best friends were, were killed in the underground movement or deported if they were Jewish, etc. So I can tell you, uh, we cannot consider it as an exciting time, but as a very tragic time. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe also that if I had met Picasso, you know, in uh, normal circumstances, nothing would have happened between himself and myself. It was in this doomsday type of uh, situation. He may not be alive tomorrow, so let's yeah. go. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't think. I think the the in in normal uh, you know peacetime, our differences would have been such that it was. Then Picasso. Well, I met uh, Pablo Picasso in uh, May of 1943 because I had that exhibition. Right. <coughs> that exhibition was not a one-person show; it was a two-person show. The friend of mine. Uh, who was from the south of France and who exhibited with me. She had been a student of Mayol. What was her name? Uh, Geneviève Aliquot. Mm. Then, you know, one evening we went to dinner at a restaurant called the Catalan, and uh, we were with the actor Alain Cuny, you know, having dinner yes, with yes. him. And uh, Picasso, who knew him, came towards us uh, offering a bowl of cherries that was <laughs> something to, to say, and <laughs> said he wanted to be introduced to us. So that was his entree. Yes. It's funny because that year, uh, no, in, uh, from 43 on, until 46, you see a, a number of balls of cherries in Picasso's yeah. paintings, yeah. which uh, kind of are related to that event. Yeah. Because he was pleased about the moment and, and just repeated it using the cherries. Well, the cherries became also a symbol, you know. I think, you see, in, in painting, you express yourself through symbols. Then many times the, the bowl of cherries was there and next to it were uh, three glasses, which were for, probably Alain Cuny and, and uh, Genevieve and myself. And then a, a <laughs> coffee pot was supposed to be Picasso, etc. So anyway, you know, many people are astonished when I say that, but it's absolutely true because the language of painting is cryptic by itself. So, you know, you, you, you make, it's like a metaphor. In, in literature, but in painting, you have to make a metaphor that is a visual metaphor. Yeah. And even in portraits, it's as much about the painter as it is about the subject. Yes, but uh, nevertheless, like for example, in the show of Picasso portraiture, yes. uh, I think Picasso is somebody who was not making, you know, portrait literally at all, but 
who would find a, a way to symbolize a person. Like let's say with me, it would be, for example, the color, a certain green, a certain blue, and certain shapes, you know? So it's like a late motif. So that person will come out mostly in those colors. Did your paintings, regardless of Picasso, began to become less colorful because of the war? Because using less color, becoming no, more I w well, there was, you know, gray. Th they were not so gray, they were more dark, darker. Dark. And also because at that time I was really very interested, in, not in Picasso, but in Georges Braque. Ah. Ah, yes. Because. As an influence. I mean, and yes, I mean as, a, as a kind of mentor, you know. Yeah. Um, my mentors in modern art were mostly Matisse and Georges Braque. I wanted to have mentors who were French because I thought I was myself entirely French, 100%. So I didn't see, I, I admired Picasso as, as a great painter, but I didn't think I was of his, what you, we call in, in in the, of his family of painters. Yes. I was of, he was more expressionistic, and I was more uh, uh, meditative, if you mm -hmm. like. So uh, my, my closeness was to people like Matisse and, and Georges Braque, especially at that time, and most, mostly Georges Braque. I think that's why Picasso, when he saw that, he thought, ah! <laughs> 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 he was he jealous of Brock then? No, but you know that uh, they had been, as you know, they had been friends and mm -hmm. extremely uh, close friends. And influenced the, each other in the creation the, of Cubism. Yeah, but you may not call that so much an influence as as a collaboration, collaboration. almost, because they were painting every day. Each evening they would see what the other had been doing and they would discuss it, etc. So uh, you might say, even though the public doesn't realize that, that painters have dialogues about painting, but they have to be with the paintings themselves, yeah. not in speech. One of the best things I loved about the book you wrote about Picasso and Matisse is the great dialogue about the armchair. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. Tell me the story. He said, well, you know, with you, Matisse can do no wrong. Yes. You know, so everything he does is marvelous, <laughs> everything. And, uh, and when it's me, you always find something that could have been, you know. So I said, no, 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 but uh, well, I think for me, Matisse, uh, I think it's, it's just as extraordinary and difficult in painting to express joy as it is to express drama. So I, I like him for that. And so he said, yes, but you see, he's a bourgeois because, uh, that annoyed me a little bit. <laughs> he's a bourgeois because, uh, and then he, he, he quoted that sentence, unfortunate sentence that Matisse had said maybe around 1910 or I don't know when, when he said that uh, when an industrialist comes back home after a long day of work, etc., he wants to sit in a pleasant armchair and look at a painting, and uh, that painting has a kind of therapeutic effect on him, and a good painting should be like a good armchair. That, of course, was very unfortunate, so I could not say that was right. And he said, what's more, he painted an armchair, which is really disgusting, absolutely disgusting, <laughs> looks like, uh, you know, if you have your, your guts, thrown on the, on, the, on the canvas, there is no vertical, no horizontal, it's all outside, you know. I said, well, it's an open composition. I was fairly pedantic at the time. <laughs> and I said, anyway, there are two verticals and two horizontals because, you know, the frame of uh, the mm. painting being uh, rectangular, then it, it, you have two verticals and two horizontals. Yeah. So I, he said, oh, you can't, I can't discuss with you when it's Matisse, everything is right. But then he carried the conversation on when the two of you went to see Matisse. And Matisse uh, and Picasso got involved into a debate about the armchair. Yes, but and uh, then you that, you jumped in. Yeah, because uh, they I, were getting. I, I knew that tense. it would. Yeah, I knew it would end badly. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and and sort of you were the one person who could sort of keep them separate because they were getting into. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I brought about <coughs> two paintings that they had done at different times. One was not an armchair, but a chair by Matisse with uh, some fruits or flowers on it. And then there was a chair of, by Picasso in 1943, which has very much more abstract, but also flowers. So I said, well, anyway, you both painted, if not armchairs, chairs. Yeah. So that, that did it, <laughs> was finished for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Go on to dinner. What did Matisse think of your relationship with Picasso? Well, first of all, when we came to see Matisse together the first time, Picasso introduced me as a young painter, I want you to meet that young painter. And so Matisse uh, 
uh, right away said, oh, that's very nice that you are bringing her here because uh, then I will make her portrait. At that time, Picasso had not made my portrait. So, of course, Picasso didn't like the idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a kind of game between them. So Matisse went on saying, yes, uh, you know, I had a lot of uh, rather reddish hair at that time, mane of hair, and he said, and I will paint her hair dark green and her skin will be pale blue. And, uh, and so, uh, so Picasso said nothing, but he said, yes, yes, we'll come back. But at that time, we didn't come back before he did himself in May, the f uh, painting, which is quite well known, the woman flower, yeah. which, well, the, the hair is green and the body is pale blue. <laughs> Directly from Matisse. <laughs> did you ever sit for Matisse in the painting that he wanted you to sit oh, for? No, Never sure. did. No. That Picasso would not hear of that. No, but I. Or you would not would hear have of that. Been a, would have been a very uh, ill-conceived thing to do. I mean, even if even if Picasso had been willing, I knew it would have been a disaster afterwards. So it was better to abstain. Yeah. Before he painted that painting, he had you model for him for an hour, just stand nude for him yeah. with just, your hands yeah. down and mm -hmm. just looked. He sat and looked yeah, at you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And you just stood there, mm -hmm. and he stood there, mm -hmm. and he looked in your eyes. I don't know you. if he looked in my eyes. <laughs> <coughs> and then at the end of the hour, yeah, that was it. It was in his head. It was fortunate because I would never have sat for him anyway <laughs> for a longer period of time. Do you think, looking at your own evolution as a painter, how would you characterize the huge shadow of Picasso on your own evolution and on the appreciation? of you as a painter and your development? Well, you know, <coughs> first of all, um, when I met Picasso when I was 21, I can say that without any special modesty because it's the truth, I was considered like one of the great hopes of my generation as a painter already. I had been recognized by other painters. And I think that uh, it was not necessarily a shadow because First of all, he was 40 years older than myself. That's two generations. So in a sense, if we had been maybe the same age, it would have really been a shadow. But since he was much older than I was, and he had done most of his work in a sense, and I had mine in front of me, he had his behind him in a sense. So it just did not, um, I thought I learned a lot from him, uh, mostly in terms of not the style, but the way he worked, the concentration with which he worked, the, the uh, unity of spirit, you know, thinking about nothing else, giving everything away for that. So I think it was a great teaching, but more, more or less indirect. So uh, shadow, you know, you can be in the shadow when you are young, what does it matter? And it's better sometimes than too much sun too soon. Many young painters now suffer from that. But he would look at your work and critique it and talk to you about it. Yes, we did, but mostly we talked about uh, art examining other painters, not because sometimes then uh, it's a little bit too direct if you speak about what the other one is doing, especially when it's not finished. So most of the time we would take examples in, uh, you know, Manet or Cezanne or Van Gogh or something, speaking about another painter, but saying what we wanted to say. <laughs> Do you think your relationship with Picasso was different because you were a painter? Well, first of all, we would not have had a relationship at all if not for that. I think th our relationship was basically about painting. Yes. I think on both sides, it allowed us to, have that, to express that passion of the mind with somebody who could understand it and to have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. I was not bad looking, but you know, there are so many other women. Oh, no, come on, women. no, 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 let's, I mean, there, there is too much about you at the time to say that you weren't bad looking. I mean, we've, we've seen <laughs> photographs of you. Yeah, okay. We know what you were like at that time. I mean, you were very attractive, and, and there were other yeah. men who had, were admiring of you sure. as a painter, but also as a woman of beauty. Sure. And I Matisse mean, would be one know, of them, and <laughs> Brock would be another. <laughs> Those things come in a package, <laughs> 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 Yes, uh, but when you look back at that period, um, as an artist for you, it was a very good period for you. Forget the personal relationship, just for your evolution as an artist, because... Yeah, because you see, uh, since at, at that time, 
uh, it's as if I had been, if I had been a scientist, I would have been like working in the lab, so to speak. So I did many experiences which are mostly theoretical, many of which are very minimalist. Mm -hmm. Uh, that people have mostly not seen in this country. But, uh, so I worked all the time. I worked very intensely, but I was not... I, di I did my first exhibition during that period in 52. You once said about the relationship with Picasso that lions like lions. I said mate with lions. Mate with lions. <laughs> <laughs> or lionesses. What did you mean? Oh, well, because, you know, People always ask very bizarre questions like, why did Picasso like you or why did John Salk like you? So I said, well, you know, usually I said lions do not mate with mice. <laughs> <laughs> they prefer an animal of their own kind. Someone who has the same instincts, the same combative spirit, the same powers. Power, yes. Power. It's all about power. Relationships are about power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. You know, even love gets very boring if it's just uh, passive on one side and the man being the only one providing ideas, etc., and the woman is passive. Then that's what I always told Pablo, who said, well, why do you always contradict me and all that? I said, because it's <laughs> three months interesting. It's a dialogue. Otherwise, you'll speak to yourself. You can speak. Everybody says yes to you. So I provide no once in a while, you know. And he liked that, you think? Yeah, because it makes you feel alive. If everybody says yes to you, uh, then you know you are very powerful, but you're also alone. You were different than any of the other women in his life. I don't know, <laughs> because I, I know who I am, but I don't know who the others are. I but mean, you do know. I mean, you know much about Dora Mar. You know what she was like. You know what Marie Therese was like. You know what Olga was like. You know what yes, sure. Eva was like. And they were all different. And they more were caught up in the orbit of Picasso well, I than think you were. Many people are not trained to think for themselves, you know. Uh, maybe in those generations which were previous to mine, uh, they had, don't forget I was supposed to become a lawyer, etc. An in charge for lawyer. I was not a stupid girl. So I, I could uh, I could be on my I could really uh, I was also born in in a, in a layer of society which was probably higher, if you like, or more complex than the others. And you had a strong father who made you a strong daughter. Yes, sure. You finally, with Picasso, as you wrote about your book, decided to leave. Yes. Why? Well, because you see, uh, when I met him, I was 21 and he was 61, and until then, in a sense, I had been having that relationship very strong with my father, and in a sense, I was uh, capable of discussing, but in the end, I would obey him most of the time. Your dad? Yes. And then when I found myself in a situation where Pablo himself could have been almost my, was the age of my grandmother, for example. So uh, to begin with, I didn't find it strange that I would have to obey him because I used to obey all the people older than myself. Then by the time I got to be 30 was a quite different story. By that time I knew very well what I wanted to do it was not necessarily what Pablo wanted to do. Plus by that time I had two children. I think they had needs of their own and I wanted them to be my main interest in life apart from my painting. At that time I was very clear about it. I, I told Pablo that our relationship had to change in na nature or else it would probably break. And also at that time he had, uh, you know, started again his uh, kind of Don, Don Juan type of uh, behavior. And I thought... His what kind of behavior? Don Juan. Oh, Don Juan. Type of behavior. His eyes were wandering. Not only his eyes, he was... <laughs> and I thought, well, this is really strange and maybe something that would have uh, made someone you know older than myself very unhappy or something i just felt isn't that bizarre i mean i might i am the one who's young i am the one who might do something like that i can't understand why he doesn't see that it's it's uh, 
very dangerous for him to, to do things like that because I'm not going to like it, I'm not going to bear it. And then in that case, I'll be just as well on my own. Since I knew I had the power to bring up my own children and uh, earn my life for myself. So he thought, when I said, well, you know, you have, you'll have to make a choice now. He thought and what was, was his choice? His choice was either we would re rethink our relationship and make it much more equal, and I would have more freedom because I needed more freedom, and uh, I didn't want to be 24 hours, you know, all the time, and I, I thought I might want to be three months somewhere else or something. Not necessarily to, just to be on my own. And, uh, but he was used to that type of relationship with me, and he thought I was not serious when I said that if it could not change, then I would leave. So he said, nobody leaves a man like me. I said, well, you have not seen it yet. <laughs> and I, hesi I hesitated for about two years because of my children. If it had been only me, I had left right away. But he knew because he would say to his friends, Francois is going to leave me. Well. He feared it. Yes, I think he said that maybe to exorcise the idea. <laughs> to <laughs> to think, exercise, to yes. get it out of his head. That yes, and to, to and reduce to think the it fear. Would, it would not happen because he would say it might oh. happen, but it would not happen. And in myself, I was quite, uh, it took me a long time to really make up my mind. Why was it hard for you? Well, it was hard for me on account of my children, mostly. When I left, La Blo Claude was six and Paloma was four, so it was really uh, depriving them of their father because I knew that after that he would pursue me with uh, a vengeance, a vengeance, etc. So that it was a very serious decision. Was he a good father? Yes, he was a good father, as long as uh, we were all under his, uh, what do you say, his finger or something. At the same time, unknown to Pablo, my father, whom I had not seen for quite a number of years, had made, uh, uh, you know, had talked to me and said that he thought that uh, my situation uh, with Pablo was beginning unbearable. He knew me too. <laughs> no, is that because and you talked to him or because he no, just he, knew you? No, he knew me and uh, he thought uh, <clears throat> that the, the relationship had deteriorated. That was known to several people, you know, so my, my father knew about that and he, he contacted me and said, well, you know, um, from now on, if you need me, I'm, I'm there, etc. cetera. So um, <clears throat> what he did, I, I said to him, no, I, I will, even if I have to do something, I'll do it on my own. I don't need you financially or any other way. But what it did to me was that it, if my father thought I was in a very bad situation, it had to be true. So, in fact, my father is probably the one who finally destroyed the relationship by what he had said. By giving you, by, if he knew it was true, then it was true. Yeah. Because you had such yeah. respect for your yeah, father. Yeah, exactly. So he thought, if he thought it was, it was not, uh, you know, it was no longer a dignified situation for me to stay there, I thought he was right. So that, that counted a lot in my decision. Do you remember and when you went to the train to leave? Hmm? When you left him, finally left him, and took the kids? Yes. Well, remember that for us. Well, we were in Valoris, and, uh, you know, I had a car pick, come pick me up and take the children to the station. And we came by the night train to Paris. When did the vengeance begin? Uh, it, vengeance, no, vengeance began right away as far as I was concerned. Yes. But the vengeance didn't start... Uh, of the children until 61 when he got married to Jacqueline because at that time she uh, wanted to exclude the, my children. From seeing their father? Yes, and that was very bad for them, of course, because it was uh, undeserved, unannounced. And I felt that um, it was despicable behavior because when, you know, when Picasso had wanted those children, I, being in a situation which was, you know, uh, unusual at that time, not married to him, I really didn't want to have children in that situation. And Picasso said, well, yes, but I do, etc., and uh, uh, I will always, uh, you know, remain a good father for them. So, in fact, 
he, he just didn't do what he had said he would do. So. You were, I mean, everybody remembers that famous Robert Kaptur uh, yes, photograph yes. on the beach with a parasol. Yes. You are walking along, and he's behind you, mm -hmm. looking like a little puppy. <laughs> yes? Well, I don't know if he looked like a little puppy. I think he looked more like uh, an animal a little bit more important than that. <laughs> but the notion was, uh, there was there is always this about the two of you, notwithstanding how abusive verbally he may have been and how... I know, but Pablo... You were strong. No, but... Pablo, you know, in during the during one day, would start in the morning by being in a very bad mood, and then you would tell him, no, it's, life is marvelous, etc., etc. <laughs> he would get decided that maybe life is not so bad, etc. By the end of the day, he would have went, he, he would go from one mood to the other, up and down, up and down. So, the fact that he had bad moods didn't surprise anybody. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, <laughs> was also a second time around because my father had terrible mood, so I didn't, I didn't care about that. I mean, I just took it in, in stride, you know, it was not so. And when he wanted to be charming, he was the most charming man that you can think of. If he wanted to charm you, seduce you, everybody would charm and seduce by him. Then after that, he would uh, play them a bad uh, yeah. joke or a bad trick if he, if he had that in mind. Do you believe that he viewed women as either goddesses or doormats? Well, that was... I regret I, re I wrote that because that was just a boutade, you know, I mean, it's something you say, but it doesn't really, no, doesn't mean very much. I, I supposedly, I was in the category of goddesses. So. <laughs> well, you were in some category that was different, yeah. in a sense, because you were, mm -hmm. you were tough. Yeah. When you look back, it has now been since you met Picasso. But in I, was, I was tough because I had to be tough, otherwise I'm not tough. You meaning were me, meaning no, by you're that tough because you are tough, not because you had to be. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? No, I'm I'm saying that with him, I had to be tough because he was tough. So I gave him as good as he gave. As he gave me. If, if I am with somebody very nice, I can be very nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. All, it's we'll, all a, it's we'll, all we'll talk exchange. about that later. But with other relationships, but then with Picasso, um, what you, what did you want to? Why did you write the book? Oh, but that was later on. I know, it was in 1963. You published in 63, uh, yes, 64. I started it in 61. Right. So it took me about two years to write it. Was it because you just wanted to document my life with this man? Or it's because not my life. It's simply life with Picasso. Life Picasso. And I forget the possessive pronoun because I'm not possessive. Oh, you're not possessive. No, and in French it's called vivre. Avec life. Infinite. To live with. It's infinitive. Ah. But the, the book was written in English first. Anyway, it's precisely life with and not my life with. Because mm. it was life with Picasso. It was him and his friends. And accessorily, I was like the camera recording what was going on. Right. Has your perspective on that changed with years, the nature of the relationship, as you become had more experiences, become wiser? Well, yeah, but I don't quite see what you mean because... In life, we don't have a return ticket, you know? I know, I understand. I know. <laughs> we have but a one-way ticket. But, but you get wiser, and you look at things, and you go through it, and you look at things yeah. back with a different perspective, as you, you know, as yeah, you might, I, have, I think might have been when you wrote a book, as you might have been at the time you were living it. You might see it differently and understand it better or differently. Uh, no. No, I don't think so. I thought that when I wrote the book, I thought it had to be written while he was still alive, one thing, and also while I was remembering everything very clearly and well. I didn't want to wait longer for those two reasons. So. And by that time, you had nothing to lose. Jacqueline had... Well, you know, had said with, with, with Picasso, I never had anything to gain or to lose. But you might not write it because, you, you, you know, you might not write it, say, for the children's sake. On the contrary. For the children's sake, it was better that I wrote it because that's how later on I won all the legal things that, that we had so that they could, you know, be completely recognized and be the heirs of their father, etc. No, on the contrary, that. And I, I took advice from lawyers. Don't forget, I could have been a lawyer myself. Yes, I know. So, so that was to the good of my children. I want to pick up the strands of your life. All right. You, you, Leave Picasso with your children. You're in mm -hmm. Paris. Yes. 
Uh, you were painting, and you've never stopped mm -hmm. painting. Yes. Uh, 1955, uh, yes. you married Luke Simon, who's a yes. painter who you've yes. known for a long time. That marriage lasts how long? Seven years. Uh, good time for you, or? Well, it was, yes, like any... Uh, <laughs> Relationship. Like, in, like any relationship, ups and, ups and downs, and especially two artists together, I think is spe specifically difficult because our styles were extremely different, and I would rather not discuss. Uh, with Pablo, for example, I could discuss art very well because we, we really had is a mindset that was quite compatible, even though my art and his art are, is different. Still, it was based on certain principles that were compatible. With Luc Simon, was more, you know, um, a painter in, uh, you know, following on one side, if you like, Chagall, on the other side, the surrealist. There was no link of that kind. We had a link of, uh, you know, love and passion, etc., but a human link, but we didn't have a link as painters. So uh, that was what made the relationship difficult because. Uh, we didn't see eye to eye in, in, in our works. And I would rather not discuss it, but he wanted to discuss it all the time, so that made life fairly Oh, he difficult. wanted to discuss yes. the differences between the two of you. Yes. yes. You had a daughter. We had a daughter Who's together. now an architect living in Paris. Yes. Who was with you in... Yes, because uh, we divorced when she was about six years she old, was, and I started yeah. to come regularly to the United States in 61, and every year, spending two months, two, three months in the United States from then on. And also at that time, I had a studio in London. And you were doing oil paintings then? You were, were you in a particular period or yeah, not? Yeah, I was in the period of the... the oh, this is, this is yeah. from that period? Yeah, and this one also, that's 1960. Oh, th so this one here is in what? 64. This is 64, Four. and this and one this is... this is 60. And tell me about those two paintings. Well, um, the one down there is a uh, reflection of, uh, I, I used to spend a lot of time in London, and when I was in London, I used to go to Kew Gardens. So supposedly that's a painter in the conservatory. I don't know why the conservatory yeah. is all red, but uh, that's... Uh, you that don't know why. You <laughs> just felt that way. It was intuitive. No, I, I just, red for me is in just intensity, mood. Yeah, okay. You know, like when you, when you compose music in a major key. If you do use the blues, it's like a minor key, you know, so it's mm -hmm. melancholy. The blues are melancholy, the reds or ye yellows are cheerful and strong. So depending what type of mood you want to convey, you use different colors. Uh, th this painting. And this painting. It's cooler. Blue yeah. is cooler. Yes, and that's also of Greece. It's called Eros. Eros. Yes, the angel of imbecility. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought that Eros, or love, is, is the angel that makes... Uh, us makes make us all crazy. those stupid it makes, mistakes. Oh, we do stupid things when yeah, we love. Yeah, exactly. So that's a big <laughs> that was a statement about that. Yeah. It's hard. Let me, Jonas Salk, you yes. go to California. I went to California because I had a show in Los Angeles in May of 69. And when do you meet him? And when I was there in Los Angeles, I went to the Tamarind Institute, you know, to make lithographs as well. And since I was there for about a month, I didn't have time to finish what I had started. So I came back in October, again to Los Angeles, uh, to finish the work I had started there. And then, at that time, the vice, executive vice president of the Salk Institute was a friend of mine. He and his wife, who was French, were both friends of mine, they asked me to to come uh, spend a few days with them when I was through with my, uh, with my lithographs. So when I was finished, I went to spend a few days with them before I went back to New York. So that's where I met Jonas. So you meet Jonas. Yes. Is in it October, love at first sight? Uh, I had told my friends, I don't want to see any of your scientists. <laughs> because scientists and artists have nothing to talk about. Right. So I said, I don't want to see any of them. So I said, well, OK. I said, I can go to a restaurant, etc. if you have to see them. I don't want to see anybody. I'm tired. I, was, I had worked a lot. I was tired. I just wanted to rest and be with them, and that's all. So the next day, John Hunt uh, comes, uh, calls at, at home and says, well, I'm coming to lunch with John Salk because we had to speak to, so I said to, so I said to my friend Chantal, I said, well, you know, I, I'm going to go to 
have lunch at a restaurant because I don't want to be with all of you. I don't want to see a scientist <laughs> that's out of my realm. So at lunch you end up with a scientist. So one so of the most famous it's in the world. It's, it's, it's silly because you just, if you don't want to talk, you don't talk. I say, fine, I don't talk. So <laughs> I was there at, during the lunch and I didn't say a word. I Nothing. Was, you just no, sat and listened. Uh, yeah. And, but what I did not know is that both John and Chantal, my friends, had described me to, to Jonas as somebody very vital, amusing, uh, witty, etc. <laughs> and he saw that lump there, <laughs> was yeah. eating the salad and that's all. He thought, this is bizarre. That person is not at all the way she has been described to me. And since he was a scientist, he, his a spirit of inquiry he had to know more about that bizarre person who didn't S behave. And he thought the only person he could find out from was you. So no, so, no, unfortunately, uh, so I was there for a few days. So the next day, there was a big dinner, you know, black tie and everything, in the honor of the Salk Institute. And he was sitting at the top, of course, on, on the, the day. day and I was at the table where I was enjoying myself a lot because there were some other artists there. So we were joking and talking. And he thought, isn't it bizarre? <laughs> I, I couldn't hardly see him because it was a large room, but he could see me and he thought, Yesterday she was like a lump, and today she's laughing like I don't know what. What is that person? So the next day he called me on the phone and told me he wanted to uh, show me the Salk Institute, which is marvelous yeah. architecture at Star by Louis Kahn, right. you know, because yes. he visited it. Yes. So he gave me the big visit. And then, of course, we started to talk because um, one of the things I love is architecture apart from painting. So then we had a lot of things to say to each other. And, uh, after that, I went back to New York, and he appeared in New York. And I went back to Paris, and he appeared in Paris. A very. And then finally, we were married in uh, uh, 28th or 29th of June. So less than a year after you met him, you married him. Yeah. Or he married you, whichever. He married me. He married you. <laughs> because I didn't want to get married again. I, I so why did you do it? No, because he said, I, I, I said the relationship would be all right, but I don't want to get married. So, so why? He did so he said, why? It's very funny. So said, why? I said, because I don't want to live with anybody more than six months a year. That's it. I need my, my own time to myself. Plus, I had my children, the three children, where, you know, my younger daughter was still 13 years old, etc. So I said, I, I have my own children, my own family. I, I just can't have a relationship like that all the time. So he said, well, <laughs> he gave me a piece of paper and he said, write down everything that you don't want. I give you an hour, so I, I wrote down everything I thought that would make yeah. the marriage C absolutely the impossible. Close, close the case. Yes, exactly. So I wrote very well. Uh -huh. And he said? And then after an hour, I gave it to him. <laughs> and he said, oh, very good, very good, very interesting. I see you are very independent, so am I. It's, it fits, it fits perfect. my perfectly. <laughs> so I thought, well, that I didn't do it well enough. <laughs> so. So um, I said, but you know, we don't know each other. And uh, it may be very disastrous because, you know, you're a scientist and uh, I'm a painter, etc. It's really very far apart. And we may discover that it's a big disaster what, what we, why you get married and then have to divorce six months later. So he said, no, no, because I have noticed that both you and me, all kinds of people want to get with us. And when one gets out for the door, the other comes in by the window. Yeah. So at least even if we don't, ag even if we are not so happy, at least we'll be like a citadel. We'll, we'll be um, a fortress know, for each a other. fortress for each other. Yeah. I thought that was very clever. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so I, I said, well, okay, then in that case, let's try. And then you spent 25 years with him yes. until he died. Yes, so uh, uh, ap apparently the, the recipe was a good one. Well, exactly, I was going to say. It was the best say. recipe because on top of all, Jonas was a man of his word. We did not, we were not together year round. Did you find that, that science and art had more in common than you thought? Did you find a common ground uh, between the two of you well, about? first of all, one thing that was entirely necessary was for me to understand what he was doing. To an extent, he also got interested in what I was doing, and we could, like that, we could speak cogently about it in the evening. In 1995? Yes. He died. Great man. Yeah. Yes? You couldn't paint for a 
worthwhile. Yeah, that's that's to be expected. It's even astonishing that that I could start again after a while. You can't paint because y your heart's not there, your no, head's it's not no, there. No, it's 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 uh, painting is a physical act. Painting you do with your body, you do also with your heart and your mind, but you do it also with your body and. Strangely enough, well, first of all, maybe my mother, because you know she had been the one who had initiated me in, in, in art, I couldn't even, I would look at a brush with disgust for six months. I just, then one day it stopped, but it's, it's uh, be beyond the will. It has nothing to do with the will. It was uh, like if you, if you lose an arm, you cannot imagine you have it. And with Jonas, you know, because we had so much, after all, 25 years and not two minutes, and we had such a good understanding of each other, a marvelous dialogue with our differences, but a marvelous dialogue. All of it, and on top of all, he died fairly suddenly. You know, I, I had the intuition. I was in New York. I had, I was supposed to come back a week later, and I had the intuition. There was a voice in my head that said, uh, "Change your ticket. Go, go away today." Today. And I am, since I'm intuitive, I have a tendency to obey those intuitions, not to let them go. So. I thought, well, it's very bizarre, and uh, even I had all kinds of appointments, etc. I said, well, okay, I phoned everybody, I'm going. They thought I was crazy. I arrived that evening in uh, La Jolla, and uh, he was not very well, but you know, he had dinner with me, etc. And the, the next morning at 6 a.m., he was really in a very bad condition, and he died at noon. So I, I had the correct intuition that it was his heart, you know. Good for you. you mm -hmm. So you got there. You had yeah, a chance to have dinner otherwise, with him. Yeah, otherwise, otherwise, he would he would have been alone in the house, you know. Uh, I thought if I had not had that intuition, I would I would have reproached that for the rest of my life. I mean, it's it's interesting about these two men. Uh, both had huge success, relatively young in life. Picasso, mm -hmm. Jonas Salk. Jonas Salk was 40 when he discovered. 39. 39. Uh, he told me, yeah. Yes. You had a huge experience, in a sense, because of the war, because of Picasso, because of what you did, who you knew. I mean, at a very young age. What do you want to do now with the rest of your life? What drives you? Well, I am a painter, and a painter paints. I mean, uh, plus, I consider that I'm doing my best paintings now. Do you really? Yes. Why? What well, makes them better? Because well, it's simply there is greater ease. They come to me more and more spontaneously. I was always rather minimalist, but let's say that minimalist about about uh, why say more when you can say less? Uh, yeah. less economy, is, economy less of means. Yes, right. Less is more. Economy of means, and I am a colorist, as you have seen probably. Yeah. So, um, but as you. As you go on in life, I think that you you put your act together more and more. It's a trajectory. You are the same person, but the same person in time has accomplished a trajectory. When you look now at the life you've lived so far, not knowing what exciting things might be around the corner, not knowing what burst of inspiration, creation might yet happen, what are you proudest of that you have done so far? What well, I'm you the proud that I, I did more than 1,500 oil paintings and, and more than 4,000 works on paper. That's not 4,000 works yes, on and paper. Yes, and they are good. I mean, I don't call that little sketches, you know, works that are really finished. So that's quite a lot of work. So I'm proud of all the work I did because I don't, if I think a work is not of a certain level, I don't keep it. So I'm proud of what I have accomplished. Do anything differently? Uh, it's, imp it's unthinkable because if I were born, let's say, 20 years ago, then I would do things differently. But c uh, when you, you have to start from somewhere, you have some roots, and uh, it's like a tree. If you are a fir tree, you are not, you are not, a, you are not a magnolia. If you are yeah, magnolia, or a pine, you're yeah. a fir. Yeah. So uh, your, your, usually your branches and your fruits are according yeah, to your roots. To so who you are, that's yeah, right. So, so, and then you develop. But still, you develop, but you always develop in the direction of what you are. See? 
the course is set by your genes, think, by think, your genes and by your experiences, early. Yes, I think that you know, there are two, three verbs in English, which is to be, to do, and to have. So an artist is the one who is and, and do and does. So. And if Pablo Picasso, wherever he is today, says to you, as he did way back when, you will always, if you leave me, you'll be known primarily because of your association with me. What would you say to him today? Yeah, but even at that time was not true because... But did he believe it? He believed it was true. Oh, yeah, well, fine. But uh, we were placed at two different angles, so to speak. And uh, in a way, if I had... In a way, for example, in 45, before when I already knew him, but I had not come to live with him as yet, I was one of, as I said, one of the most upcoming and forthcoming mm. painters of my generation, like the style, etc. And knew everybody. And, and knew everybody. And I would have been better off just staying where I was. I would have been better known sooner. It was not the opposite. So uh, I, I put that in my book to show the difference of of uh, uh, understanding or of a situation by two different people. Let me hear you clearly. With respect to the Picasso relationship, we know 25 years and, and the pain you felt when Jonas Salk died. Picasso was different because you walked, walked away. Out, yeah. You. When I left, it was really finished because when he died, I didn't suffer one bit. You didn't? No. Was finished. I, I, I was. But you, still in you have two children by this man. Well, then, and then, well, I, I love my children. You don't love their father. Well, it's stupid to to, to love their father. I love the, his paintings, but I don't love him anymore. Yeah. Why should I love him? For you, who are the great artists of the twentieth century? If you if you start with you know. Kandinsky, the, the German Expressionist, uh, Yavlensky, uh, Franz Marc, etc. And Matisse. The, Matisse and uh, Bonnard. Barat. Barat. Georges Braque, etc. And then later on, uh, the style in, in this country. For example, I like Lee Krasner a lot, mm. better than I do Pollock and uh, Hans Hoffmann and... Uh, Mikuning and Johns. And I, I like Jasper Johns a lot. Yeah. I, I like who I like. I don't like everybody. Are you influenced by people around you as a painter? Because it is said by many people that Picasso's later work was not nearly as good as what he did earlier because he needed to work and be fed by people around him. I think it's true of everyone. Including you. Yeah. You, you can't... I don't think anyone, a hum human being, can exist in a void. So when he was you behind you that... Need, you need, for example, Picasso needed poets as well, maybe even more poets than, than uh, to interact with poets as much as to interact with other painters. I think it's a stimulation. Mm. For example, there is a bit of competition. So you see what the others are doing. You want to do something else. It's, more, it's opposition many times, but that opposition is very constructive. And I, was, I didn't want... I didn't feel myself to be in an inferior position vis-a-vis -vis Pablo at all. Never? No. Not once? No. no because, uh, I mean, wh what is this? I mean, if you, if, you are, if you are in relationship with another human being, then you are two human beings. Otherwise, it's not worth it. You know, if, he, if, he, if, he's, uh, if a person is supposed to be a god and I'm only a human being, then it's not worth it. Why am I wrong in this assessment? You two were really very much alike. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. Very. Both of you... We deserved each other. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You deserved each other. Yeah, we deserve each other. Yes, sure. That's why it lasted quite a while. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Ogni histoire, c'est l'histoire d'un amour 